This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm Brian Martin, Vice President of Medical Affairs here at UPMC Children's. And I'm Amanda Pahalik, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Immunology. Our guest today is Dr. Alejandra Hoberman, Chief of General Academic Pediatrics and President of Children's Community Pediatrics, an affiliated primary care pediatric practice here with UPMC Children's. Welcome, Dr. Hoberman. Hi, Brian. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for inviting me. Alejandro, we are really excited to hear about a, an important study um, that you are the primary or lead author on in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, regarding operative or surgical versus non-surgical management uh, for otitis media in children. Uh, with that little bit of an add-in, uh, would love to, to hear a few words about it, uh, how the study came about, and uh, any other information you'd like to share. Absolutely. So um, we conducted a, a large randomized clinical trial uh, that was completed uh, and published in May of 2021 that looked at children with recurrent acute otitis media. Uh, and over the years, uh, children with ear infections are treated with oral antibiotics, and when they have recurrent acute otitis media, which is defined as three episodes in six months, four episodes in one year, with one episode over the preceding one month, they had been uh, having tympanostomy tubes placed to prevent future recurrences and reduce the rate of recurrences. And with the concern that if you have recurrences, children get treated with antibiotics and then they're going to be overexposed to antibiotics with the increased likelihood of antimicrobial resistance. So the paradigm of the study was to try to determine, okay, can we uh, manage children medically without placing tympanostomy tubes potentially and without an, uh, seeing a high rate of recurrent ear infections and uh, without seeing an increased rate of antimicrobial resistance. And in that way, we randomized 250 children uh, who met the criteria that were six months to 35 months with recurrent acute otitis media to receive tympanostomy tubes within a couple of weeks and get treated with ear drops uh, topically whenever they had the future ear infections or medical management, which meant antibiotic treatment with every time they had an ear infection and followed over time with a guarantee to the parents that if they were to meet enough ear infections to qualify as treatment failure, that we will at that point, recommend tympanostomy tubes. Again, all of these children had at least three ear infections in six months or four ear infections within 12 months. And they all had received the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which is the game changer of this study. All the previous studies had been done prior to the introduction of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And what we found is that there was no difference in the total number of subsequent ear infections between the two groups. That a uh, of course, ear infections in the tympanostomy tube group were characterized by having ear drainage uh, and uh, one additional symptoms, and children in the medical management were more likely to have uh, the usual presentation with uh, otalgia and with uh, low-grade fever and so forth. But there was also no difference in the proportion of children with severe ear infections. People tend to think, and the editorial that Dr. Walt wrote on the New England Journal of Medicine issue uh, there was a concern about children in the medical management group having more severe ear infections than the one in the tympanostomy tube group, and that was not the case. About half the kids in the tympanostomy tube group and half the kids in the medical management group qualified as having a moderate to severe ear infections with, with symptoms. So the outcome that you measured was primarily looking at um, how you know how many of the kids continued to get inferior ear infections after the fact, right? I'm really I was curious if there were other um, portions that of the study that you could measure or maybe d weren't able to measure but would have liked to have measured, such as you know um, how long it took to resolve the initial infections that they were being treated for, 
or um, you know whether they had any issues with hearing um, or, or how long it took them to regain their hearing in order to sort of for the younger children get back into the classroom and be able to participate in in their you know instructions or be at home with their families and feel like they're really engaging developmentally. Absolutely. So we did find that the rate of ear infections that was the primary outcome of the study was the same between the two treatment groups. There was no difference there in the intention to treat analysis. We did find also that during the, we followed them for two years. So we did find that during the second year, they were half as likely to have recurring ear infections in each of the two treatment groups. So age made things better no matter what, but it was true in both treatment groups. We did find that the severity of the ear infection, probably severe, and when we talk probably severe, we talked about having fever more than 39 degrees or having moderate or severe autalgia, was the same between the two treatment groups. We did find that the, the tympanostomy tube group did delay by about two months the time to the first ear infection, and there's a Kaplan-Meier figure in the, in the paper that basically shows that, that it takes longer to have that first year infection if you got tympanostomy tubes placed. It also shows that kids who got tubes were more likely to present with otorrhea versus the ones that were in the medical management group were more likely to present with other symptoms of acute otitis media. There was no difference in the symptoms, and we measure the symptoms using the acute otitis media severity of symptom scale. Um, there was no difference between those. There was no difference in the likelihood of protocol-defined diarrhea. There was no difference in diaprodermatitis. And um, yes, there were significant differences with regard with tube otorrhea that was more likely to happen in the kids who got tympanostomy tubes placed. So with regards to hearing and development, that's not a question that we addressed in this study. And the reason why we didn't do that is because my mentor, Jack Paradise, many years ago when I was a, a fellow and a junior faculty in the, in the, the department, uh, did a very large NIH-funded study that had a very similar design that looked at children with otitis media with diffusion or persistent fluid in the middle ear. And in that particular study, hearing loss and, and development was carefully assessed and was found not to have any difference between the children that got the tubes placed right away versus the ones that got it later on in case that they were continuing to have a persistent milieu effusion, which was in most cases they didn't get tympanostomy tubes. Mm -hmm. So we did not have, we did not find an impact in that previous study uh, of the presence of milieu effusion on the hearing or the developmental outcomes of those children that were followed up all the way through the were 11 years of age and even looking for ADHD or other symptoms or other presentations that did not happen. So in this one, it was not called for for us to do hearing tests or to do any developmental screenings. I see. I see. Interesting. Alejandro, I have a question about shared decision making and what I'll call maybe parental preference or bias in the two arms of your study. Um, did you during, and I recognize this was over a period of several years, and there may be sort of cultural evolutions that parents might either prefer surgery or think of surgery first versus not having surgery, or maybe the medical management uh, might be seen as inferior, not as definitive um, as, as having tubes placed. Can you speak a little bit about what the shared decision-making process looked like for parents and families and, and whether or not your providers uh, sort of saw any uh, cultural bias? Yeah, we did. We did. And in fact, in any large clinical trial like this one, parental preference has an influence because it, it, it results in crossover of patients between the two treatment groups. And as you saw on the, on the consort diagram of this study, there were 121 children that were managed with oral antibiotics and 54 of those eventually underwent tympanostomy tube placement. 35 actually underwent tube placement because of failure of medical management. So it was called for by the protocol that those children who continue to have recurrent ear infections, and I'm going to say the number again, 35 out of 121, ended up getting tympanostomy tubes because it was the, the, the criteria for the study that they were supposed to get tympanostomy tubes. But there were 19 parents 
that decided early on, even though they were randomized to get timpanostomy, uh, to uh, they were randomized to get timpanostomy tube of medical management, but they decided within a few weeks of being randomized in the study that they wanted to get tubes placed. Mm-hmm. So in some way, that is what messed up a little bit in the in, in the area of the crossover. We looked at those children very carefully, and and there were another. I think it was a total of thirteen kids that were randomized to the tube group that declined surgery. So it goes both ways. Mm-hmm. And there were no nothing specific about those children that made them different than the ones that were perfectly randomized and fulfilled their randomization group as expected. So um, there was nothing about them that differed in, in any way. So, But having said so, the decision-making happens on the back end. So if we think of children, I'm, I'm, and, and again, the, we didn't talk about antimicrobial resistance. I want to hit that point because yes. that's an important one. And then we go back to decision-making. Okay. There was no difference in the likelihood of bacterial resistance, even though they got treatment with antibiotic multiple times over the next two years they were not more likely to harbor a resistant pneumococci or a better lactamase producing H. influenza. At the time of the acute otitis media, at the routine Q8 week visits, or at the end of the respiratory season, which is when you would expect to see resistance because they got treated multiple times. Mm -hmm. So if there was no benefit in reducing the rate of ear infections, and there was no benefit in in reducing the likelihood of resistant bacteria in the nasopharynx, then we can question why do we need to truly place tympanostomy tubes in children with recurrent acutitis media. But having said so, mm-hmm. it's not true because there were some children that did develop recurrent ear infections after having met the criteria for recurrent ear infections and being randomized in the study. And that would be probably a third of the children Mm-hmm. that meet criteria with recurrent ear infections. So it reassures me that one can take a deep breath when they meet criteria of recurrent ear infections and say, okay, let's try to follow them for the next few months and see how mm-hmm. they do. Mm-hmm. And if they have two ear infections over the next, you know, 45, 60 days or three in, in, in six months, then those children would still should be treated surgically. And, and, and the, but that's a fewer proportion of children than all the ones that meet criteria for recurring ear infections. So I guess um, maybe one question I have is maybe a little bit um, sort of off Brian's question about, yeah, the decision of the of the families and the parents of, you know, if, if you have these different choices, and like you said, some parents do prefer to do surgical, um, but also sort of thinking a little bit beyond that, I have a follow-up question, which is, you know, do we have any understanding about why some children have these recurrent infections? You know, so many kids have an ear infection or two, they get treated, it's a minor issue, and it it never comes up again. And it's really quite interesting to me that you have some patients that, you know, continually get these recurrent infections. And I'm just really curious about what's known about that um, and what kind of research might might be done to sort of answer those kinds of questions of, you know, why does this happen in the first place for some children? Well, we we did notice that during the last uh, year and a half of the pandemic, or close to two years of the pandemic, we're getting in some way there was a significant reduction in the number of ear infections, which is starting to pick up again now mm-hmm. as we uh, reintroduce children into a day care or a preschool exposure. Um, all the measures is that we instituted, social distancing and, and use of masks, reduce the exposure to viruses. We do know that there is a plumbing problem and it's the way the station to this this is aligned in some of these children that some are going to be more likely and some are going to be less likely. Um, We do know also that if they're in in exposed to uh, other children in a daycare setting and we define exposure in clinical trials as at least three children at least 10 hours per week You can have, you know, four kids in the home, and uh, that becomes a daycare in some way if they're bringing it from outside. So it's three children at least 10 hours a week, and that comes from the old Jack Paradise studies over the years that he clearly uh, was able to separate them in in those two groups. So exposure to other children makes you more likely to have have recurrent ear infections. We do know that, 
you know, a, a measures that are used to protect against your infection, like the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, have improved over time. We, we were using a PCV7 vaccine, now we're using a PCV13 vaccine, and I, we are discussing PCV15, and there are some PCV21 vaccines coming down the pike in the next few years. So the more serotypes are included, the more protection, and the FDA is going to be looking at these vaccines eventually for um, an indication for prevention of acute otitis media. We do know that preventing influenza uh, may have an impact too. So we're, we're getting children immunized against influenza every year is another protective mechanism. So all of those, in addition to the shared decision making that we know now, that you don't have to jump right away and place tympanostomy tubes, that you can observe them for a little bit longer, that the tincture of time is going to make things better because children will age and the recurring infections are going to decrease no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's also important. And the fact that even for some of our ENT colleagues in the study, my co-investigator Diego Preciado at Children's National Medical Center, uh, being an ENT physician, he had placed many tympanostomy tubes. He was shocked to see the lengthy durations of tuberia that many of these children had because in the context of a study, you follow them very carefully. And otorrhea can be a nuisance as well. So um, all those things need to be taken into account. That dovetails well into my next question, which is, you know, within the ENT community um, who clearly have been asked for, you know, decades to be managing uh, recurrent otitis media surgically, have you seen, uh, how do you think that these findings will be embraced or, um, or refuted or discussed, do you think, within, uh, within our surgical colleagues' minds and societies? So I, I would say uh, the study provided clear evidence as to what the rate of recurrence is. So in, uh, now we need to quote these current data as opposed to studies done in the pre-pneumococcal uh, conjugate vaccine era. Yes. So we know what the rate of ear infection per month is. We know what happens during the first year. We know what happens during the second year. So that allows decision-making and shared decision-making with the parents. We also know that we cannot claim that reduction of antimicrobial resistance is why we praise tympanostomy tubes. Yes. Uh, because there was no impact on that as well. We also know that we need to get more stringent in the diagnosis of acute otitis media, um, into what constitutes acute otitis media, and, and that mm -hmm. the presence of a bulging tympanic membrane and symptoms need to be present. And that is not the case in many times when children are seeing at urgent care facilities uh, and, uh, you know, uh, retail clinics and so forth. So in some way, we need to be very tough in what we call an ear infection and then mm -hmm. makes it that we need to be tougher what we call recurrent acute otitis media because we cannot take every diagnosis that happened as it, that it truly was acute otitis media. It could be an otitis media with effusion in many instances as the, we were talking earlier, Brian. So yes. my point is, the decision making in the ENT community needs to allow parents to say, okay, it looks like your child had a lot of ear infections. We also have this newer study that was done. Why don't we take a deep breath and wait a couple of months and see how your child presents and see if they continue to develop recurrent ear infections. And if they do, placing tympanostomy tubes will definitely be beneficial for those children. But that will reduce by probably two thirds the number of children that actually get tympanostomy tubes. That's significant for sure. Yeah, I mean, this is really it's such an interesting study, um, and and so important. And really, for me as a as a parent of young children, I find it really, really valuable to have these kinds of data out there and to know that you know these questions are still being addressed. That the standard of care is still something that we have to consider for even things that you know most parents take as simple ear infections, you know, and, and, and to know that these data are out there is fascinating and really phenomenal. So thank you so much for your amazing work. Yeah, thank you. Th Alan. Yeah, thank you, Alejandro. I, I really like particularly at the end about the the, the quality of diagnosis and the, the um, I, I guess I should say that the elevated thresholds in terms of that the, the, your work has, has challenged, I think, um, 
individuals to think carefully about what that diagnostic process looks like, the validity and veracity of it, um, and then in turn how that really does drive a lot of downstream, uh, you know, disease trajectory and, and performance. Uh, this is this is a great time having you on today. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for for sharing this with us. Um, and uh, we look forward to having you on again. Something tells me this won't be the last time we'll be uh, we'll be speaking about the findings and some of that uh, work that we're doing for diagnostics here um, at UPMC Children's. Uh, spoiler alert to our listeners: uh, We'll be looking forward to bring Dr. Hoberman back to talk about some uh, some uh, aids and diagnosis, if you will, for Titus Media that he's working on some other very cool AI-related stuff. So we're uh, we're looking forward to that next conversation. That's great. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks so much, Amanda. This is this is this is truly fun. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you again. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Please sure to subscribe to keep up with our new content. Feel free to leave a review and tell us what other topics you'd like our experts to cover. And thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. <laughs>